Morning, everyone. How you doing? You awake enough yet? Ah, uh, dear. Right. Bit of audience participation. How many of you own any x86 hardware? <laughs> I saw at least one person not put their hand up. Come on. You can't be that disabled. You're not Steve. You haven't broken your arm yet. Um, all right. How many of you got unreasonably drunk last night and are wishing for the sweet release of death right now? Uh, I just thought I'd wake you up a bit. Um, cool, right. So, hello. Um, I'm Graham Sutherland. Uh, I work at uh, Cisco Advanced Security Services. Yes, I know that stands for ASS. Um, apparently nobody told anybody. Um, either that or they just didn't care and thought it was funny. Um, so, yeah, I've been a penetration tester. I started at uh, Portcullis uh, almost five years ago. Uh, we got acquired uh, about almost two years ago by Cisco, so I'm still there. Um, and I'm going to be talking about motherboard hardware and chipsets and all sorts of weird things that uh, you can find inside there. Um, so where did this all begin? Um, so White Quark on Twitter, uh, they're pretty awesome. Um, sort of pointed out that you can just sort of download the data sheet for chipsets, which seems very strange. And uh, yeah, I found all sorts of strange things in there and uh, sort of started me off thinking, huh, oh, I could start looking into this stuff as well. Um, so the scope of this talk, uh, essentially we're just going to be looking at uh, identifying security issues with modern computer hardware, mostly on uh, motherboards. Essentially just treat it like you're tearing down some IoT hardware. Um, looking at uh, privacy issues and ownership issues, um, yeah, architectural uh, design failures, uh, and uh, trying to find uh, persistence on motherboards uh, outside of the hard disk. Um, true fileless malware, <laughs> buzzword. Um, and the weird things that I found along the way that made me laugh. Um, and there's been quite a few talks on various x86 stuff before. There's been stuff on uh, Intel Management Engine, there's been stuff on AMT, there's been stuff on all sorts of different aspects of hardware, but there's never been sort of a, a, an overarching thing that just sort of discusses um, a sort of wide coverage. Um, so just going to acknowledge a bit of previous work. Um, this is just sort of a, a select few bits and bobs that I uh, happen to uh, have a read of uh, and was, I found useful. Um, this is sort of a, a bit of a disservice to the million other papers and awesome things that are out there. So uh, uh, apologies to the, those that I've missed, but there's a lot of work out there already on this kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah, read your, da uh, your chipset data sheet, which sounds weird, you know, it's not like it's a little temperature sensor or something, it's a massive chipset, it's got all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, Intel just literally does give you a data sheet like any other, um, it's about 700 pages or something. Um, you don't need any account to download it, it's totally free, uh, cont contains all the useful things that you would expect to find in the data sheet. It's also not that really difficult to understand what's in there. Um, there is a little bit, a little bit of domain-specific knowledge that's required, but to be honest, um, it's largely quite readable. And if you get stuck, you know, there's Twitter, there's IRC, um, and people will help. So, section one: messing with Intel Management Engine. So, Intel Management Engine is a sort of subsystem that sits inside the chipset um, that uh, sort of handles a whole bunch of stuff to do with uh, how, the, uh, how the motherboard works and, and, and how the system runs, but it also has a whole bunch of stuff allowing it to do things like talk to the internet without, um, without the CPU knowing about it, so it can do like out-of-band communications. And this ties into uh, stuff like AMT for like, uh, remote, uh, remote management, um, which some of you may be aware of the recent AMT vulnerabilities that came out around that, and that was quite interesting. Um, I won't be talking about those though today. Um, so the rationale of why you might want to mess with IME, um, it's always running. Uh, it has memory access, which is concerning. Uh, it's got direct NIC access, so it can talk directly to the network, uh, the network adapter. And that can be either wired or Wi-Fi. Um, and it can talk out to the internet doing that. Um, hence why the AMT stuff was kind of interesting. Um, but it's a closed platform. Um, Intel wrote the firmware, and it's not like open source or anything. You can't roll your own, it's all signed, some of it's kind of compressed or obfuscated. There's not really any sensible way to assess the security of it. So there's a lot of people going, oh, I don't really like this like weird Intel binary blob running on a sort of weird hypervisor always running thing on my, on my motherboard, and they want to get rid of it. 
So digging through the data sheet, I happen to run into this piece of information. So flash descriptor override pin strap status, or FDOPSS. Um, so this essentially says, put Intel management engine into debug mode and unlock the flash, which sounds kind of weird. Um, I was reading through this and went, oh, that's, that's um, interesting. Uh, why would you be able to put management engine in debug mode? And, and how, do, how is that done? It says it's using an external strap, uh, sorry, it's, uh, external pull up on HDA SDO. So the pull up is just basically a resistor connected between a particular line and uh, a power rail. Um, let's start looking a bit more. What is this? Flash descriptor security override. Um, so it must not be asserted after manufacturing and debug. It puts it into, uh, puts the Intel management engine and uh, into a debug mode and disables the ME features. Hmm, might be quite useful if you want to turn ME off. So how might I, um, I, I, I turn this strap on? Well, here's the pin I need to get to. Uh, to, to, to paraphrase James May, oh, cock. Um, it's a BGA part, and there's no bloody way you're getting anywhere near that. However, um, there may be other ways to do this. Anyway, uh, I, I, I thought this was quite kind of weird, um, so I posted it on Twitter. Uh, and it got a bit of a reaction, which sort of started me off going, huh, OK, this, people seem to find this kind of interesting, so uh, I should probably look into this some more. Um, so at this point, what did I know? Um, so HDA SDO is the HD audio serial data outline. So your chipset talks to uh, what's uh, is essentially a, an audio codec. Um, so it's uh, when you've got like 7.1 support or sort of like optical out or any kind of HD audio on your motherboard. There's a separate chip uh, for the codec. The chipset has a, a, a sort of serial data uh, protocol that it uses to talk to uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, the audio chip. Um, and for some reason, Intel chose this HD audio line as where they should put the ME debug strap. It sounds kind of a, a weird dual purpose, but um, if you, uh, oh, I've written pulling it low at boot. It's not true, it's actually pulling it high. Um, my bad. Uh, and IME debug mode unlocks some registers, and uh, yeah, we know that Intel doesn't want to use that functionality because they said don't as assert it after manufacturing. But what don't we know? Um, we don't entirely know what ME debug mode actually does because you know there could be all sorts of things in there that we, we're not entirely sure. How, where can we access HDA SDO? So I mean, we know it goes to that particular chip, but that could also be a BGA uh, a part, and it could be really difficult to touch and be really annoying. And what happens if we mess with the registers that are uh, in there and, and, and start messing with the flash as well? Someone else to the rescue, which is always great. Um, basically, look for prior research whenever you're looking at this kind of thing. Turns out none of this was new. Um, people knew about this. Uh, the uh, uh, Libra Boot and Cor Cor uh, Core Boot folks uh, uh, and uh, the people who wrote ME Cleaner already knew about this stuff. They'd already known about uh, HDA SDO. Um, they know it stops IME from executing, but unfortunately it breaks the integra integrated uh, gigabit NIC. Uh, the reason for that is that the gigabit NIC um, it has its own like special control channel from the uh, chipset so that it can do all of the management engine stuff. And in the process of the boot sequence, uh, the IME is what sets all the uh, hardware configuration variables for the, the gigabit NIC. So if you turn the uh, IME off, guess what happens? It doesn't configure the NIC and it doesn't work, which is a bit of a pain. Uh, and it also sets a 30 minute shutdown timer if you assert this strap. So what happens is it boots up and it goes, right, IME is off. And it goes, right, well, because I'm not running anything, uh, I'm not able to control anything. So therefore, uh, after 30 minutes, I'm just gonna hard power off the system, um, which is annoying. And the IME uh, sectors in the flash are signed, so you can't muck with them easily and stop messing with the firmware, um, sort of. So. Neutralizing IME. If we can't just kill IME, can we like make it not do things at all? Um, so if you find the HDA SDO pin on board, um, you can, uh, I keep saying pulling it to ground. I've written this wrong. It's pulling it to 3.3 volts, I think, um, to assert the strap, boot the system. Dump the ME firmware flash from map memory, because it does get mapped into, uh, uh, into memory that the operating system can read. Neutralize it with ME Cleaner. So ME Cleaner is a bit of open source software that basically goes through, and they worked out that uh, you can actually wipe most of the sectors. Uh, so it's like a partitioned firmware table. 
and then the signing data and then each partition is individually signed, idea being that um, if a vendor wants to add a, a new partition, they don't need the Intel signing keys to sign all of Intel stuff again, uh, that, that it's all separately signed. It turns out you can actually wipe a lot of those, uh, uh, a lot of those partitions out and uh, ME will still boot, clear the, uh, the timer, um, uh, so it won't do the, the 30 minute reboot, um, and it won't actually do a whole lot. Um, unfortunately, it did very, very, very variant depending on which laptop you're running it on. I don't think anybody's done anything with any desktops yet. Um, and the laptops that this works on is like uh, old th IBM ThinkPads. So, you know, like the old T40s and stuff. Um, so there's not really any particularly modern gear that you can do this with. Um, and then you write this neutralized image back to ME Flash and then reboot and it should just work. Now, the other option. This is actually the option that most people choose. Find the ME flash device on the board, which is an 8-pin SPI flash chip. Um, just desolder it or use an IC clip, but usually desolder it. Use flash ROM to dump the flash, uh, neutralize it, and then write it back and then reboot. So the ME cleaner approach, as I described. The ME firmware split into partitions. Uh, partitions are signed. But the FPT, the firmware partition table, is not signed, which means that you can just remove the partitions. Um, you can't remove the, uh, that, as I've said, the only partition that can't be removed is the factory partition. There are some cases where that's not the case. There are a couple more you can't remove. But in general, you can neuter uh, IME fairly well this way. Now, the problem is that these kind of require you to mess with hardware, and people who want to sort of lock down their, uh, uh, you know, and, and sort of own their own device and not have this weird Intel thing running on their system. Um, would like, quite like to do this. and It would be very convenient to not have to sort of open up your laptop and get to the motherboard and start faffing with, you know, soldering things on and, uh, or, you know, desoldering ICs and things like that. Um, so the problem is no motherboard designer would ever expose IME straps in a way that we might abuse, would they? Or would they? Um, so what you're looking at here is a circuit. So um, uh, if you ever want to know uh, what your laptop looks like in terms of a schematic, chances are it's all been leaked online. Um, mother motherboard repair is a fairly big industry, um, and in the States, right to repair has been quite useful for this. Um, so you can download uh, the schematics of pretty much every laptop out there. Um, for some reason, it doesn't work the same on desktop motherboards. I think people just see them as more of a commodity to throw away, whereas a laptop, it's much more difficult to sort of justify that. Um, so in this case, what you're seeing is, um, where are we? Uh, so the ME unlock pin that you can see in the middle, it's in, well, I was about to say it's in the green square, but everything's in the bloody green square, um, goes to the uh, HJSDO line on the right, um, on the, yes, on the right, uh, and then you've got this uh, uh, sort of uh, interconnect on the left here with these two resistors, and then at the bottom, We've got this uh, uh, ME unlock pin, which is the, connected to the keyboard controller for whatever reason. And then Toshiba did this, where uh, you've got uh, the keyboard controller again talking to uh, where are we here? Uh, yeah, we've got uh, got it talking to uh, this this uh, debug trap again. And then we've got this one. Uh, oh, hang on a minute. Did I just? Oh, sorry, yes. Um, so, that, yes, this particular strap, again, allows the keyboard controller to disable IME for whatever reason. Uh, <coughs> oh, excuse me. Um, and then we got the same kind of thing again for Acer. Thank you very much. Oh, and uh, this one was particularly great because uh, when I saw the ME unlock, uh, these question marks were actually put in by whoever reviewed the PDF, uh, reviewed the schematic. <laughs> so, clearly, they were as confused as I was and just like... What the hell are you doing here? Why is that? What? What? what what's happening? This is very strange. Um, yeah. So there were a lot of question marks that um, that made me laugh quite a bit. And um, this one was particularly weird. This is uh, like some uh, very uh, sort of uh, obscure uh, x86 platform for uh, network hardware. Um, and yeah, it's slightly strange. They have a jumper exposed on the board where you can just plug in a jumper and it just turns an ME debug on. It's very strange. Um, then we get into things that are, are broken not by um, a, a sort of design weirdness, but by specification. Um, so 
this is where you sort of get into this interesting uh, area of where Intel have gone, right, well, we, what we need is we need a, a, a line, uh, you know, a data line that nobody's going to be really paying too much attention to, um, to use as this uh, debug strap. And we'll cross-purpose that for, I don't know, let's HD audio, that'll do, screw it. Um, and then the HD audio spec says, oh, actually, you can expose this HD audio data pin externally to the laptop. Um, so the hot attach mechanisms are designed to uh, allow uh, the... Uh, the audio codec IC to not be on the laptop motherboard. You can have it in a uh, in a dock, and then have that be communicated with over the docking connector. Um, so, the idea was assert the ME debug strap uh, via the docking connector on a laptop, um, so we don't have to disassemble the laptop and start soldering on things. Unfortunately, docking connectors are proprietary. Uh, they change between laptop models. They've got uh, all sorts of very strange uh, formats. They all seem to be different for everybody, uh, and it's very annoying. And unfortunately, it doesn't look like anybody used, well, from the 180-odd laptop schematics that I sat and trawled through, I couldn't find a single one that exposed uh, anything on the docking connector, which was unfortunate. So the future work for this part uh, is trying to identify and document convenient locations to interfere with the, uh, IME, um, and find a way to restore the gigabit NIC without ME access, which would be quite nice. Except, somebody found a better way. So about a couple of weeks before this talk, as is always the way, I spend ages doing a whole bunch of research, and two people come along and nullify it all. Um, hey JP, high availability platform. Uh, these two guys, uh, Mark and Maxim, um, Discovered that there's a hidden flag inside this uh, uh, this sort of Intel configuration thing uh, called High Availability Platform HAP, and essentially the idea is that their power power customers, their high end customers, uh, can configure very uh, specific behaviours that the chipset and processor um, uh, con uh, configured. Uh, uh, Various behavior for for those two uh, for those things, um, and there's an no undocumented flag in there that entirely disables ME, uh, and you can do it all from software. Um, it's now been released into ME Cleaner. Um, it still breaks the gigabit NIC because uh, it doesn't uh, allow. It, it, obviously, the, it's the uh, management engine that um, uh, sets that up. So. There's still some future work to be done in terms of uh, identifying a way to restore the functionality of the gigabit NIC. Uh, but now you can disable ME from software, and that invalidated pretty much everything that I just talked about. <laughs> Thanks, guys. But it, it is kind of cool, um, and it means you don't need to disassemble the motherboard, uh, disassemble the laptop, and start looking around with the motherboard. So let's move on to some architectural issues uh, in laptop motherboards, mostly. So, the chipset has a few privileged buses, um, and they talk to various peripherals um, for various reasons. These are privileged because they, you don't want other things uh, uh, interfering with stuff that's on there. So, for example, uh, the keyboard, the TPM, and the NIC, um, these are quite impo important devices, and you potentially don't want them sharing a bus with other devices. Um, so, how do we find them? You look at all the motherboards. Um, it's expensive to buy every motherboard laptop and start tearing it apart manually looking, and it's also a pain in the ass. So you just use the leak docs. Um, so you write to repair for the win. Um, so I spent hours and hours and hours and hours and hours looking through various laptop schematics and uh, then ran into this. So <laughs> the dim socket has these two pins, uh, SCL and SDA, so therefore uh, the SM bus, uh, which is a system management bus, um, and they're also connected to the LAN controller. Why is the DDR socket connected to the LAN controller? Because we know the LAN controller can be controlled by, uh, so the uh, LAN can be controlled by a SM bus because uh, that's how IME talks to the internet. Um, so this is very strange. Um, and then, why does my RAM have access to the Wi-Fi? <laughs> this is not the same motherboard. Um, so yeah, find, finding um, a few laptops where they'd made this weird mistake, where they'd essentially shared the SM bus from the uh, uh, from the memory sticks uh, to the uh, Ethernet controller or the Wi-Fi controller was very strange. So I propose a new concept: the Internet of Dims. <laughs> 
Um, so what what is this uh, this SN bus on the on the on the memory devices on the on the DIMMs? What what does that talk to? Um, so it talks to this thing called Serial Presence Detect SPD. So it's an it's an IC on each DIMM that stores uh, things like RAM configuration. So if you've ever done any overclocking, you know things about timings like uh, you'll get timings like five 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 fifteen, these values and lots of other. Uh, detailed uh, bits of information gets stored in uh, this uh, SPD chip. Um, the, the, uh, the standards body for this is uh, uh, JEDEC, um, and if you read through the standard and look at what's in there, it gets kind of ridiculous because they've got things like uh, the physical dimensions of the stick inside the SPD, which is a little bit weird. It's like, why does my motherboard need to know exactly how big my RAM chip is? This actually starts to make sense in like a compute cluster because you need to know like heat management stuff, but um, but yeah, it should be an SMBus slave device. But SMBus is multi-master by design, so what I mean by slave device is uh, that the uh, the PCH, the chipset, is the bus master it controls who can talk to who, and, and it essentially it asks for uh, uh, an SPD device to give it some information and it gives it back. Um, but SMBus is multi-master multi by design, so what if that SPD chip decided to become bus master and start talking. So what's stopping it? Not a lot. So that's what an SPD chip looks like. The thing circled in red. So you've got a stick of RAM and this tiny little eight pin chip. And the eight pin chip is essentially just a bit of flash. So an SPD IC is just an EEPROM. Um, so common ones include those things there. I'm not going to read them out. Um, it's, they've got fairly ubiquitous pinouts, so they're, they're kind of uh, standardized, even though they're, they're made by different manufacturers. Um, so you've usually got three address select pins, um, a ground VSS, uh, SDA and SCL for the uh, clock, uh, data and clock, uh, a write control pin, or in some cases the write control pin isn't, res uh, isn't present and it's just a non-connected pin, and VCC for power. And coincidentally, an AT Tiny uh, 85 microcontroller has a compatible pinout. So what if we made a microcontroller that pretended to be the SPD? So uh, at the top there, that's um, uh, an SPD IC. So you've got these E0, 1, and 2. Those are the address select. Uh, you've got the VSS, which is your ground, VCC, which is power, WC, which is write control, and SCL and SDA, which is for the SM bus. And then if you look at the bottom, you've got the VCC and ground in the same positions. Um, the uh, address selects uh, you generally don't need to worry about, and on the positions on the bottom uh, bottom right, uh, the SCL and SDA pins just happen to line up with uh, pins on the AT2085 microcontroller that support interrupts, which makes it really easy to write uh, software uh, SMBOS. So the approach is replace the SPD EEPROM with an AT2085. So you've got a RAM stick that actually is Doored in a weird way. Um, I should point out that the SPD does not have access to the data that's on the RAM stick. Um, it, it's completely separate to that. Um, so you write an interrupt driven SM bus listener on those PB0 and PB1 pins, and when you want to swap it over into an evil mode, it becomes the SM bus master and starts sending network packets via the IME. So suddenly your DIM is talking to the internet. So what's the status of this at the moment? Uh, well, I have a fake SPD working. Uh, unfortunately, the SPD master code, uh, SM bus uh, master code, uh, I haven't completed yet, so I can't demo um, a Nick talking, uh, sorry, the uh, DIM talking to the internet just yet. Uh, I'm really sad that I haven't got that far. But the plan is have a magic value sent to the SPD via the operating system. So in this scenario, you will have rooted the operating system, uh, but what you want to do is have a surreptitious uh, sort of covert channel out and uh, you can essentially do that directly via, via talking through this. It's not a particularly um, feasible attack, but it's funny, um, and that's why I did it. Um, so I've worked out some of the NIC commands. It's ongoing development. Uh, no demo on that bit yet. However, if I've got time at the end, I will show you a quick demo of some funny stuff that you can do via the SPD. Um, yeah, hopefully I've got time for that. Um, so section three, Persistence. So, what if you want to persist data, but not on the disk? Well, what have you got access to? Well, there's the UEFI BIOS. There's the IME firmware. Um, we know we can mess with that in some scenarios, um, but it might be a little bit difficult. Uh, SMM, that's tricky. Um, 
there's some research that's gone into that, but the, the, they really, really don't want you to get access to that from, you know, running, even from ring naught. Uh, peripherals. So, um, yeah, the, the, there's all sorts of peripherals, and that can be things like disks, that can be things like graphics cards, RAID controllers, Ethernet controllers, anything like that. Um, uh, RAM, can you do non-volatile persistence on RAM? Maybe. And other ICs on the motherboard. So UEFI BIOS, uh, it's user flashable, um, but the updates are usually signed. Um, the data persistence is possibly, uh, uh, is, is, it's kind of possible via uh, empty config section, sections and other sections of the flash that just aren't used. Um, but it's a, a quite targeted attack and the failure state is you break the motherboard. Um, so if you're trying to be sort of subtle and hide, um, maybe bricking the motherboard is not the best way to go. Um, of course, the IME firmware, again, physical access required to flash it, which is a pain in the ass. Um, some regions are OS accessible if you mess with the uh, Intel flash descriptor. Um, some of the, uh, uh, the partitions are Huffman coded, um, but that's been reverse engineered. Uh, I didn't know that until uh, quite, uh, quite uh, possibly like the, uh, two days ago, and a guy called Nico H told me uh, that that's been done. Um, so this is potentially useful as a, as a uh, sort of persistence mechanism for data. Uh, SMM, it ain't happening. Um, there's a lot of research there. Uh, there's very, very new results suggesting that there may be ways to write uh, and dump uh, SMRAM, but potentially not, probably not persistence in that, in that scenario. Um, so I'm just going to skip over this because I don't know a whole lot about SMM, to be honest. Peripherals. These are great. Um, so GPU, NIC, SSD. Um, how many of you here have updated the firmware on any of those three ever? Cool. Yeah, so quite a few of you. Um, yeah, so you can update your SSD firmware, you can update your Ethernet controller firmware, GPU firmware. Um, so they're all usable, user upgradable. Um, the checking of signatures is variable, and uh, in a lot of cases, uh, they only check the signature of the uh, length of the data that you specify in the header of the firmware. So the slack space of the flash device, you can just use however you like. Um, so it's potentially useful for storing secrets. Um, so for example, if you're uh, trying to do the whole like fileless malware thing and somebody comes along and does a memory dump, well, what if all of your keys to decrypt the stuff that you left in the memory dump were in the GPU firmware flash? They ain't getting that. Um, so that'd be quite interesting. RAM, no, not the volatile bit. The SPD flash is read writable from kernel space. You can actually flash it. Um, and it's known to be an exfiltration vector, and I will explain that one in a minute. Uh, so yeah, the slack space and the unused fields can be used for uh, secret storage. Um, and you can actually, I have actually got a working case of uh, cross-site scripting from the SPD flash, um, which is the, <laughs> which is the demo that I will show later if I've got time at the very end. Um, so the, uh, when I say known to be an exfiltration vector, I had a very interesting chat with a chap who works in, um, secure hardware reuse. Um, he does some very interesting uh, low-level stuff. Um, and his clients are the kind of people who care about this kind of thing, like surreptitious data being, sto uh, data being stored surreptitiously into uh, various bits of hardware on uh, their machines. Um, they're the kind of people who will pay somebody to spend quite a long time researching this sort of thing. And uh, he was involved in a scenario in which uh, somebody had a, um, a single window of opportunity to install a piece of software onto um, a system, which they should not have had access to. Um, they, need, they were attempting to gain access uh, to some key material. Um, and uh, so they dropped uh, a USB device into this system, uh, installed the, uh, installed a, uh, a piece of code and then left um, and later what happened was the uh, box went down for a uh, scheduled reboot and didn't come back up and what happened was they went oh okay what's wrong uh, the server then said oh you've got a RAM fault so they took the, they took the faulty RAM stick out and they put it in uh, to be RMA'd so it went to the post room and then the guy tried to steal the RAM stick out of the post room and got caught. 
Um, if he hadn't have been caught, then they would have never known that he'd done this. But the SPD flash was completely overwritten with the key material that they were trying to steal. So they used a stick of RAM as an exfiltration, de uh, exfiltration mechanism, which is um, slightly scary. Uh, I, I imagine that the kind of person who was wandering around uh, uh, in a postal room was possibly not also the person who wrote this fantastic piece of exfiltration nutcaseness. Um, and I'll leave it to your imagination as to who might have that kind of capability. <laughs> it's a very, very weird situation. Um, so other mod motherboard ICs, uh, the chipset has scratch registers. So um, chipset drivers uh, often use these scratch registers. Uh, it's, they're quite similar to um, CPU registers, except they're usually bigger. So uh, a few, maybe like 500, 512 bytes or so uh, usually. Um, so these are volatile registers, but um, the kernel can write to them. They don't exist in CPU space. So again, if you're trying to hide something out of RAM, PCH scratch registers are quite interesting. RAID controller firmware, that's fun. Um, if you've got RAID controller on your motherboard, just write data that you want to, ex uh, want to hide away inside of that. There's non-volatile flash basin sensors. So a lot of the time, things like your temperature sensors on your motherboard actually have EEPROM in them, and you can write to that. Um, so again, another place to hide it. And hard disk environmental logging, so telemetry data. So um, who here has uh, bought a hard disk from uh, Western Digital, uh, like one of the black, red, or whatever series, uh, and read where they say, oh yeah, you can't put that, we won't, uh, honor the warranty if you put this in uh, a RAID array. So not the reds, the, or the greens and the blacks and whatever. Um, well, the way they know about that is that uh, write patterns and things are categorized and stored as telemetry data uh, onto an EEPROM chip inside the uh, hard disk. Um, they also log things like temperature, uh, min-max, things like that. It's like smart data, except way more detailed. And this is also where the smart data is stored. Um, so yeah, the hard disk actually has a whole bunch of flash on it that you can just write to live. Um, do not ask vendors how to mess with that because they get really cagey and upset because they assume you're trying to screw them. Um, so secure, re secure reuse. Um, this is an interesting sort of field of research that's starting to sort of grow in, in size. Um, so in some cases, if you are reusing bare metal hardware, for example, if you are selling dedicated servers, you know, you're renting them out, um, and then you want to reuse them in front of the client, well, what's to say that the previous system didn't store a bunch of weird stuff or modify firmware in some way? So modifying firmware, exploitation of firmware via modifying data, and exfiltration and other contamination of uh, uh, sort of persistent uh, writable devices on the motherboard and peripheral hardware. So the approach here is uh, work with motherboard vendors and peripheral vendors to uh, identify where non-volatile uh, non storage exists on a system. And then dump the contents of those devices as a known safe sort of uh, set. This is before any customer ever touches it. Uh, boot, use the system, reflash, um, verify the rights and check the stability. So check that once you've booted the system once and then you go back and reflash it, you don't break your motherboard. Um, so uh, and then you store this known good state and restore it before it crosses any customer boundaries. So once you've uh, moved this, uh, moved a different customer onto this hardware, before you do that, you restore the, uh, the known good state. And there are a lot of challenges here. So as I mentioned, uh, vendors are potentially unhelpful. It helps if you've got a, a good relationship with them, but HD manufacturers do not like it when you mess with the telemetry flash, because that's essentially their golden ticket to telling you that, no, we are not going to honor your warranty. Um, and you need to validate the state before the first customer use. You can't sort of go, oh, actually, yeah, this sounds like a really big problem. Um, we should go and create a no good state from this hardware that the customer has been using for the last four years. Um, it's, yeah, you know, you can't be retroactive about it. It's, it's got to be done ahead of time. Uh, it's also laborious. Um, you've got to go through and verify a lot of flash stuff, and there's a lot of effort involved, and you've got to do a lot, lot of work with the vendors. Um, and yeah, the potential failure state is that your hardware is bricked. So that can get expensive real fast. Um, and yeah, loss, of, loss or compromise of the known good states is catastrophic. So you've got to be careful about that as well. So solutions to this are having good 
relationships with your vendor. Um, so in the case of server hardware, people like server, uh, Supermicro, um, if you're a, a fairly big company, then chances are that you may well have a good relationship with them or be able to build one. Um, if you're a mom and pop shop, chances are you're probably not gonna have the money to do this in the first place all the time. Um, so yeah, early identification of risk. So invest early in this kind of thing and plan appropriately and automate where possible. Um, at the moment, there are no, as far as I'm aware, there are no like open source tools. There's no framework for this. There's no, you know, there's no standard. Um, the people that I know that have done this um, have built hardware interface jigs. So essentially a uh, big 3D printed uh, a set of stuff connected together with test probes uh, that moves across and gets put on top of a motherboard and it connects to all the right positions um, and does all of the testing. Um, again, this is months and months of work to build these things and uh, a lot of effort. Um, but it helps reduce the manual effort. So that's always good. Uh, and having a clear procedure and multiple val validation and verification checks. So validating that things have been flashed correctly and ver verifying that that data is correct. Um, and that can help eliminate potential bricking of your device. And secure and redundant storage of the uh, known good states, because if you've got a known good state, but you put it on an SMB1 enabled box somewhere, um, that's no good. Um, worst, well, you know, the best case, somebody ransom wears it, encrypts it, and you lose it. Best case, somebody comes and mucks with it. Uh, sorry, worst case, somebody comes and mucks with it. Um, so, conclusions about this. You should look at your hardware data sheets. Um, Chipset, processor, anything like that. It's really not that difficult to start digging into this stuff, and it is a good laugh. Um, you find silly things in there. Um, and yeah, vendors don't always follow good practice in design. Uh, supply chain attacks, they don't necessarily need to be a target of the security critical devices. So you don't need to do a supply chain attack on the TPM. You don't need to do a supply chain attack on the processor. You don't need to do it on the PCH. You can do it on a stick of RAM, which is much easier in many cases. Um, and secure reuse of hardware is really difficult. Um, there's a lot of effort going into that in certain spaces, um, but I doubt we'll see it become particularly common. And it is quite concerning to think that every single, I mean, there's probably quite a few laptops in here, two just here, um, that they're just full of writable devices that just nobody really thinks about writing or securing or looking at. Um, so I'd like to give some special thanks. Uh, White Rock on Twitter, uh, Tim Brown, because he bought me this laptop that um, if I've got time, I'm gonna show you a demo on. Uh, the anonymous hardware security guy who told me all about that uh, interesting little exfiltration trick. Uh, Nico H and JN on Coreboot and lots of people from Libreboot who helped a whole lot in me understanding some of these things. Um, how am I doing for time? Hmm? Oh, 15, wow, okay, I finished that quick. Damn. Uh, okay, so who wants to see a demo? So, oh God, this is difficult. I can't see my mouse. Where's my mouse? Here we go. Right, so this is this laptop down here, um, which is of a um, non-specific make. Um, I won't tell you which one it is. I'll just say that um, if Doge owned a laptop, he'd probably own that one. Um, am I clicking the read button? I think I'm clicking the read button. Um, I don't know whether you can see here, uh, I think that right there says uh, G Sutherland um, because I've modified the, so the uh, RAM stick in here um, does not have a normal SPD flash. It has an AT, AT Tiny 85 instead of uh, the flash. Um, so when I wrote the data into that, uh, I changed it. Uh, but it also turns out that you can modify it. Um, God, this is really difficult. I can't see. So what happens if I change the, uh, the model part, uh, module part number to something a little bit more interesting? Um, so this is modifying what's on the SPD flash. Um, so what if I put an iframe in it? <laughs> um, 
and then update. Huh. Huh. And then if I write that to the device. So this is written to the APROM. Um, I'm really, really sad that um, this system does not have uh, like the old school boot sequence where you can see all of the data that's going on. It's got one of those crappy like splash screens that you can't turn off because uh, I would have loved to see whatever arbitrary text I put in there spin up at the start. That would have been very funny. So if I uh, close this software completely, um, so uh, that bit of data that I've just written is in the RAM. Uh, if I were to, let's say, swap out your regular RAM stick for this RAM stick, um, and then I were to, oh uh, God, I can't even see what I'm doing here. No, that's not what I wanted to do. Uh, of course, uh, for this kind of thing, you have to break out the finest in overclocking tools. And there we go. So that's come back from SVD flash. So that RAM is now backdoored with an XSS for this particular tool, which is the most ridiculous ta attack on the planet because nobody will ever fall for that and it will never be useful to anyone, but it made me laugh. Um, so yes. Um, yeah, fun. Right, that's, uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Hey. right, and that's pretty much it. Any questions?